so because the world is no longer seen as partaking in an accessible order, in a telos, in a, in a reason, effort gets redirected to what is accessible, which is individual things. Uh, you're taking Francis Bacon and the new organon, ripping nature apart to see what makes it tick, to see how it works. Uh, knowledge now has to be certain because it, we needed to manipulate the world to have some certainty in our existence, uh, which means that all other knowledge, knowledge that can't be proven to be factual, is seen to be mere opinion. And so we see uh, morality becoming nothing more than subjective opinion. This is what I think. You can think differently. Yeah. There is no objective way to measure these things. It's simply opinion. Um, also, ethics becomes contingent. Um, the law is now an act of God. It's an act of God's sovereignty. It doesn't come out of God's intellect, God's nature. So because the moral law can't be discerned by looking at the nature of things, but only by the law, the sense of order and purpose in the world is lost, and morality becomes subjective. Um, as Jonathan Sheehan pointed out, the nominalist application of divine om omnipotence, the radical freedom and alterity, otherness of God over against his creation, evacuated natural knowledge of any ethical and moral component. We looked at um, what I call scientism, the idea that only scientific knowledge uh, is true knowledge, and the fact that in the modern age, this is replaced by the self-assertion of the individual. The individual um, becomes the basis of a world that the person creates. So, what does this mean for the way we live and the way we live together? It seems to me the shift to is transforming the world into something that is manipulable, that can be measured, that can be controlled, that can be predicted. It's a means of self-defense, of giving ourselves some sense of control over the world, some sense of control over our, our environment, over our destiny. It's a way to give some kind of meaning to things, to overcome this insecurity that overtook us when we lost the idea of um, God and God's nature. So I think, I wonder if this drive for order and control, for rationality and manipulability, be it well, wherever we see it expressed, if it comes from this need for security, of wanting to have some order, something reliable, some context to our lives. Neoliberalism um, dissolves all kinds of social and community bonds, all ties and all obligations. Everything is reduced down to the lowest common denominator. It gives the illusion of freedom, but I don't think it's a true freedom. I think it's a very lonely form of liberty. And by neoliberalism, I mean the, um, the exacerbation of the liberal movement, classical liberalism, that occurred starting, oh, about 1980 or so in the English-speaking countries, uh, certainly in, um, with Thatcher and Reagan. They were the, I would see them as being the vanguards of the neoliberal movement of um, government is bad, everything should be reduced down to um, private enterprise, only private enterprise can do things uh, efficiently. The market becomes the new god, the new moderator, the new judge of all things. It's, it's in a way, it's a religious movement. If we just believe in the market, if we have faith in the market, then all of our problems will be solved. 
And if it doesn't work, then clearly our faith was imperfect. We were holding back. We weren't giving all of our faith and trust over to the market because if we did, we wouldn't have any of these problems. So to me, it looks very much like some kind of a, a para-religious um, commitment that's being asked to the marketplace of, of neoliberalism. Uh, I see communities being ripped apart. There's no regard for community ties anymore. And when we sever our context, our connection with others, be it in the family or in the community or down at the general store or at the truck stop or at the gas station or at the church or at the grange, we find that there is very little left. Um, we're told that the individual is the basis of society, but I don't see how that can work. So I see us seeking connection, belonging, meaning in pseudo-communities, um, political parties maybe, or identity politics. Oh, these are my new people. I finally found my tribe. Even though it may be virtual, maybe it exists only on the internet, only on social media. Um, we're looking for new connections, new places where we can find um affirmation and validation capitalism i think thrives on the insecurity of the worker why would you go to work in a dark satanic mill if you didn't have to if your survival didn't depend on it so the word insecurity came into english only in the 17th century, around the time we see the rise of capitalism, uh, the marketplace and wage labor. This isn't to say that insecurity didn't exist before this, only that we didn't have this, this word for it. So we felt the need now to have a word for it. Peter Morin saw wage labor as being a very much an unfortunate development. His idea of the agronomic university was one that championed people living with each other in community, working as much as possible uh, locally, as much as possible working for the community to um, make, the, make the small community function. He's hearkening back to the idea before what was called in England, the enclosure. In Scotland, it would have been the clearances. In other countries, it would be the primitive accumulation, a process that's still going on in the global south today, where land that had been perhaps owned by somebody, but it was in common use. People called commoners could use the common land to grow their food, to haul their water, to cut their firewood, to trap, to hunt, to fish. They didn't own the land, but they had the right to use it. And as a result, the standard of living in the late medieval period was actually quite high. And there was very little, except for famine, there was very little real poverty in Europe. Um, because if you could always fall back upon uh, the parish or the monastery or the estate for your sustenance. But when the land was seized and common land was made into private property and was closed off, uh, people were forced into the cash economy and they had to go to work. They were left with nothing left to sell except their labor. So this primitive accumulation or enclosure or theft of the commons was not an accidental consequence. It was done deliberately to force people to go to work into the cash economy. Insecurity is also fed by the drive 
for consumption. All you have to do is turn on the television and look at the commercials for pickup trucks. Turn on the television. Look at the lifestyles of the rich and famous. You know, your, your problem is your, your truck isn't big enough. Your problem is your SUV is last year's. Your problem is you're not wearing this year's fashion, whatever it is. The economy runs on endless consumption of unnecessary goods that people buy with money they don't have. So this insecurity that we feel, economic insecurity, social insecurity, it contributes to depression and anxiety. It impedes the healing from trauma. If we have a difficult childhood or if we experience trauma as an adult, no matter what it may be, um, we need a secure environment in order to heal from that. Not only does the environment need to be secure, we need to feel secure. Because if we're always looking over our shoulder for the next catastrophe, where's the next meal coming from? Where am I sleeping tonight? So on. We're never able to recover. And that fosters any number of somatic complaints. A lot of auto, a lot of people who have difficulty recovering from serious trauma, they also have autoimmune disorders because their body is always keyed up. The cortisol is always surging. They're always looking for the next catastrophe, the next shoe to drop, uh, the next bad thing to happen. And there's a correlation between poverty and mental illness. Probably the the causation, the causality goes both ways. Our prejudice oftentimes is to assume that bad judgment makes people poor. People are poor because they haven't taken care of themselves. They haven't delayed gratification. They haven't gone to school. They haven't finished school. They haven't learned to trade. They haven't gotten married before they had children. Um, they haven't saved for their retirement, so on, so on, so on. But it also works the other way. That chronic poverty, always scrambling to survive the day, it leads you to make bad judgments. You're not thinking ahead. You're not planning for the future. You're thinking, you know, what dumpster am I going to sleep behind tonight? I think that a lot of us take capitalism for granted. I, I heard a quote I cited a few weeks ago in one of these sessions that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Capitalism has become so ingrained in our society that we feel as though it's inevitable. We feel as though it's the way that things have to be. We feel as though this is the natural order of things. A lot of what we think of as being human nature, as being well, just the given, the given state of being a human person, is actually, I think, a result of the way we've chosen to organize our society and our economy. I've seen an increase in villainizing and blaming people who are not able to thrive in the marketplace. There are people among us who just cannot make it in the competitive marketplace of capitalism. You know, they're just, they're not able to sell their labor enough to provide for a decent standard of living. And they get blamed and villainized. A lot of the problems get blamed on the individual, not on the social, economic, and political environment in which they're embedded. Oftentimes, what appears to us to be some kind of a 
maladaptive behavior is actually a very rational response to an almost impossible situation. Mental health sufferings are oftentimes due to a constellation of social conditions rather than the individual physiological, psychological, or behavioral conditions. You know, that there are some that are going to be there no matter how you organize your society. Some of the illnesses will still be there, but many, many, many of them are the consequences simply of the way we neglect the weakest and the most vulnerable people in our society. Many of the helping professions are colluding with the neoliberal insistence on achievement. I was talking one time with a psychiatrist about a patient who had just approached for treatment. Young man, maybe 40, early 40s maybe, had struggled with delusions his whole adult life. And he was telling me, you know, I, I, I feel like a failure. I'm 42 years old and I don't have a place to live and I don't have a job and I don't have any skills. I just feel like my life has been a waste. My life has been a failure. So I reported this to the psychiatrist who said, well, he's right. His life has been a failure. Not a very good attitude to have, doctor. This psychiatrist was taking this modern neoliberal insistence on achievement, on accomplishment, on ability, and judging somebody because he wasn't able to achieve or accomplish. When for him, just getting through the day was all he could manage. So we see an emphasis on measurable outcomes and metrics and best practices. Many of the treatments that we offer are to enable people to conform and adapt to a, a society and an economy that is fundamentally disordered, twisted. Hatching them up so that they can go back in and try to function in a society that doesn't value them and doesn't want them. Many of the mental health problems they're social and economic in origin, but they're being addressed on an individual basis. Capitalism is such a part of our world that we fail to see it for what it is. Meanwhile, many people who would consider themselves to be progressive um, have become mired in identity politics. Middle America, the flyover country, has been ridiculed and denigrated. If you want to make it in America, you've got to move to a cool city, become technologically skilled. If you stay behind, there's nothing there. There are no jobs left. You can get a minimum wage job, maybe, at the gas station or the nursing home or the diner. That's about it, unless you want to join the military. I'm reminded of uh, Hillary Clinton's comment about a basket of deplorables. 
which I think is a very unfortunate way of referring to human beings. Or Mr. Obama's comment about people who are clinging to religion and guns. Neoliberalism is an all-encompassing rationality based on competition and inequality. It's not based on cooperation and the just distribution of the world's resources. We see an increase in deaths of despair, suicide, alcoholism, drug use, um, even single car crashes, they're oftentimes suicides. Youth suicide, adolescent suicide in this country is up 45% since 2007. We've built a world that people don't want to live in, or they can't live in it. 